it's it's okay. Okay, we just we just didn't I just didn't hear an you announcement. Did, you're right, um, Kathy. I did not record. I'm I apologize. I just did record now. Okay, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Would you like me to repeat any of that? Yeah. Yeah, that was a yes. Okay, <laughs> so re repeating. Um, so the site, the Fort River site, we do know that it has high groundwater and um, poorly draining soils. So the goal for the buildings, if it's a new building or an addition and add reno, would be to raise any of the new portions of the building um, a, a, a foot to, to feet, it changes depending, you know, it will depend, and pull, put under drains in to pull water, pull, pull the groundwater away from the building foundation. Then the stormwater, because the, the water in general, the, the high groundwater, is not necessarily part of the floodplain concern. So there are two different elements. One is really heavy rain events. The Fort River would could overtop and spread onto the playing fields. And so that's where the 100-year floodplain comes into play. The groundwater elevations and the poor soils are is, is a different component. So we would deal with them slightly differently. One is staying out of the floodplain, which is what the proposed building, the existing building is outside the floodplain. But it, our understanding is having um, issues with high groundwater. So we would try to manage that high groundwater by pulling the water, putting sub drains in and pulling the water away from the building. And we would also raise up the building, raise up the parking lots, raise up the playing fields potentially, adding sub drains to pull the water for the high groundwater away. Stormwater, which is the water that's coming, raining onto the site. Right now, um, there's a significant amount of impervious area, which is the roof runoff, as well as the parking lot runoff. That water we need to manage in some way before it gets to Fort River right now. It is flowing in that direction. There is a large culvert on the site, as well as um, the, the site is a lot of the site is graded towards Fort River. So we would capture that runoff in bioswales in the parking lot, like narrow swales, maybe in the parking aisles, capturing the runoff that's in the parking lot, directing the roof runoff. So it's all going towards the south portion of the building, of the site, closer to Fort River. And um, at the very Southern end, putting in something like a constructed wetland or potentially a very shallow um, detention basin that depending on what the town would like to see there, um, we can manage that additional stormwater. We're not going to propose any exfiltration or infiltration on this site. Uh, we would detain it and provide water quality treatment with um, plants and vegetation. And then it would eventually discharge at the southern east corner towards Fort River. Later on in the presentation, we have some photographs of those techniques. So you can talk to those. And, and the only other thing I'd like to mention is because it is a single story, 80,000 square foot building with significant paving, um, either a renovation, addition, or new construction would actually reduce the impervious area on the site. So that certainly works in our favor. And then Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about the soils and how that impacts the construction. Hi, I'm Mike Calvert. Uh, I'm a principal at uh, OTO. I'm a geotechnical engineer. Um, the, I'll talk about Fort River and some of the uh, uh, concerns that, regarding geotechnical issues. Um, to be frank, uh, Fort Rivers uh, is a challenging site, but they're all challenges that can be uh, dealt with during construction. They're all manageable. Uh, in no way is the Fort River site unusual in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, later on, I have some site, some slides, a slide on a project we just did in East Hampton that uh, had many of the same issues and the same concerns and that that school has uh, been around for 10 years and is uh, 
has uh, um, has operated without any any problems. So, but a very similar site. But so the issues at Fort River, one is, as uh, Janet had said, we have high groundwater and the soils are poorly draining. Um, the, the high groundwater impacts the engineering of the building in that the building tends to be damp and moist and uh, you have water concerns. Um, uh, and it also affects pavements and sidewalks and things like that around the building. You get frost action and stuff. So the high groundwater is something that would have to be dealt with in the design. Uh, we have some slides of potential uh, um, uh, solutions to that uh, in the further on. But so you have to think of the high groundwater table. It's between one and four feet below ground surface. So the, the water is pretty close to the surface. Um, the other concern regarding Fort River is that the site's underlain by a soft clay, which is present throughout much of the Connecticut River Valley and other portions of Amos. I'm sure people have, have seen it, this soft clay, um, all the playing fields at UMass. I mean, it, you see the, the um, they all have similar soil conditions to this site. So, but um, the soft clay is a concern regarding building settlement, uh, the uh, parking lots, subgrades, things like that. Uh, so we would have to um, deal with that in the design. So, and also with the soft soils, you have a relatively low bearing pressure for the foundations. So you have to take that in account. Um, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, for the groundwater, um, obviously for the renovation, it's difficult to raise the building, but for a new building, you would probably raise the slab elevation at least. Uh, at least two feet, maybe more. That brings you out of the water table. It leads to a dry basement uh, building. It uh, improves drainage around the building with all the sidewalks and stuff. It improves all the drainage in the parking lot. It, in, in, it requires the bringing in to fill into the site, but that's something that can be done. And you, you actually raise the building a little bit, which solves a lot of your groundwater problems and your drainage problems. Um, it also enables you to put your soils on uh, you're building on better soil, so you get a higher bearing capacity. But one thing, you do get settlement uh, of the building due to the weight of the fill. Um, so the soil below feels not only the weight of the new building, but it feels the weight of the fill that you're importing. So the building will tend to settle, so you have to manage that during construction. And I, and I have an example of how we would manage that. Um, you know, in, in East Hampton, we used pre- <clears throat> Preloading, we put the soil fill on early so that the soil settled under the fill that we were adding so that it didn't settle after construction. So that's a technique that's used, uh, uh, commonly used, and it's pretty commonly used in the Connecticut River Valley. It's, it's something that we do uh, uh, with the soft clays that are present in, in, uh, in, in the valley. So we would do that. And also you'll see at East Hampton, we use what's called aggr aggregate piers that basically stone columns that you drive into the ground that stiffen the soil. The way I envision that, and I use an example, if you think of a pin cushion and you, and with the sand, if, you, if anyone remembers pin cushions, when you push it around, you know, it's very pliable. But when you put the pins in, it stiffens right up and the, and the pin cushion will get nice and stiff. And basically that's what you're doing. You're putting these stone columns into the soil and stiffening up the soil. So it's, uh, um, and, and that's basically what you're doing there. So we do a combination of the two things. So to address those problems, but Fort River, as I said, has some challenges, but they are solvable and they're not uncommon for the Connecticut River Valley, so. Thank you, Mike. And, and we have examples as well. Um, so if we uh, talk Donna, just yes. I see Sean's hand is up. And oh, I was, I'm sorry. You know, and I, I wanted to know whether you want to take questions on each site as we do them before we go to the next site. So uh, we can do that. And I apologize. We kind of try to organize this in a way. Let, let me just um, quickly just show some of the examples. So so this is uh, what Janet was referring to as it relates to how we manage the stormwater. They actually tend to be, you can see here's 
some of the uh, retention, bioretention ponds that actually we end up being able to use as part of the educational uh, component of the school. This is an opportunity with the red maple here that you can see that this is another way of draining the water slowly and um, throughout the site. So, and, and even in the parking lots to the upper right-hand corner. Janet, do you wanna talk a little bit more about this? Um, only that these are um, good examples of areas that we could put in in different places. The goal would be to have small um, areas like it, within the parking lot and that could be used for educational opportunities to kind of show uh, students the difference between if you have a vegetated area compared to a um, impervious covered area, what that does to the runoff and how much faster it flows over impervious compared to vegetated. Having small areas like maybe closer to the playgrounds or whatever that show stones and plants and it can be an educational opportunity for um, pollinators or you know the habitat flora and fauna along the way. Um, they can be various sizes. They can be relatively small if that's what works. They can be larger um, as in the top left. It can be a good size area. Maybe they're two feet deep. Um, maybe they're deeper depending on what the grading is in the area. But um, the goal being the, the, the one further south would be the largest, but the ones closer to the school and in the parking lot would be uh, configured so that they fit within those areas so that they can be all different sizes and shapes and um, but and they generally tend to be very shallow. So, Sean. Uh, thanks, Kathy. So, uh, um, Mike, you mentioned one. I was just wondering maybe afterwards if um, if you all could send us maybe two or three schools that have been built on similar sites and use some of these methods um, that are somewhere between 10 and 20 years in that we could reach out to and just talk to them and get yep. their get their thoughts on how things are, have gone. Um, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I can definitely give you some uh, uh, some uh, recommendations. So thank you. To see. Yeah, and I'll go over the one example here in a minute. Okay. And, I, you know, again, um, we thought we had this organized in, <laughs> in a uh, thoughtful manner, but he, here's here's the Fort River structural analysis. Rick, kind of, or or Mike, if you want to talk through this, I can talk through this, Donna. So, what, as Mike was saying, on the renovation side, uh, in Fort River, because because it has already shown that there are moisture concerns and the concern about with it sick building syndromes, and with the amount of of uh, the extensive renovation going on uh, it, in either site, the suggested would be uh, the cutoff drain that, that Janet mentioned, the, the perforated pipe would be installed around the perimeter of the building to divert the water. That's the other way, Donna, it's, it's at the toe of the foundation. So that's a cutoff drain in excavating that. One thing that buildings didn't do in the 70s would really have vapor barriers either on foundations or uh, under slabs, you'd install a foundation uh, vapor barrier and uh, insulation. And then at Fort River, because of the close proximity of the water table to the existing floor slab, uh, we'd take up the floor slab and uh, install a foot of stone to form a capillary break and then put the air and vapor barrier and a new slab, and in that foot of stone, we would have drainage pipes that would also wick water away. Um, you duplicate all that on the right in new construction, but in new construction, you could also raise, as, as everybody said, raise the grade, pick, pick the building up a, a foot or two or more, depending on the, the site designs. Uh, and all the same elements there are in play the vapor barriers, uh, continuous vapor barriers, stone wicking water away and drainage. And on the new construction, uh, the crosshatch area underneath shows that that would be the soil improvements, either remove or replace 
or the RAM aggregate peers that uh, Mike talked about. Did anyone have any other questions? Okay. Yeah. We're moving to Wildwood, Donna. Yeah. Yeah. So I just have one more, and I, I don't really need a um, definitive answer, but if I look at those two options on this site, it looks to me that the new building gives us a stronger solution to the issues of wet because you can raise it um, as opposed to the renovation. So just that's an observation. Um, then my other question on this is you've got the building going up. Um, how much of the land around the building do you need to raise or to what extent? And I don't need like this many acres, but because I think the goal is to get the water to move away from the building. So it's just, so there's some amount of the land that also has to come up, whether the land is the parking lot, um, the playground, you know, some sense of, of what's outside the building that's got to come up. So would you raise it by that same amount, I guess, as my, and put new soil? It's a question. So as, as we've stated, um, there's high ground water throughout the site and the fields are also impacted by the high ground water. So our recommendation is to raise the fields as well as the building itself so that everything is at grade that would also be the parking and then do something similar to the fields where we would have this uh, sub drain underneath the, underneath the field layer to also act as a barrier for the high groundwater coming up. So we would also raise the fields um, to, at the same level and that would improve the field drainage and usage of the fields. The other thing to consider is, is with accessibility, you need to have an accessible route from your parking lot into your front door, out to your fields. So, so you try to do that without having to negotiate ramp systems to get you up into the building and then down back and on the fields. So it would be a blending of, of all the new grades to try to make it as, as natural as possible. Thank you. Are we good? All right. So at Wildwood, uh, we actually, as, as everyone knows, this is kind of sits in a bowl. The existing school and the existing site sits in a bowl. We have an elevation of 40 from, say, from Strong Street. I'll say there's a 40 foot grade change from Strong Street down into the existing uh, Wildwood site. We have a culvert, which isn't identified here, but there's a culvert coming from the pond on the opposite side of Strong Street that runs along the driveway and then um, heads east through the lower parking lot and then drains down into the middle school site. So we wanna be mindful of that. And we also understand there's uh, lots of utilities that are running through the site that we have to be mindful of. Um, the site as well has some challenges as, as it relates to groundwater. I, you know, everyone has been, it's more obvious, I think, to everyone over at the Fort River site, but at Wildwood, there's also high groundwater, which is not as significant, one to four feet, but this is two to five feet below surface. So the same similar techniques would also need to be provided at Wildwood. And Janet, why don't, why don't you just, you can walk us through it. Yeah, uh, again, Janet Bernardo, civil engineer with the Horsley Witten Group. Um, the, the, the primary difference between the two sites is that the Wildwood site has some st steep slopes coming down into it. And we would wanna capture the runoff coming down those steep slopes in some type of a swale uh, surface trench drain to so that it doesn't impact the rest of the site. And then we would, um, similar to Fort River, add small bioretention areas around the building, around the parking lot and on the play areas. So um, the water will, again, it can exfiltrate or infiltrate 
whichever word you choose are basically the same. Um, a little bit, but um, as Mike has said, you know, the soils really are not very conducive to a lot of infiltration. So we would capture the runoff in bioretention areas, bring it all the way down towards uh, Tan Brook, and eventually we would be discharging it to the um, in a similar direction as what existing um, conditions do, but very contained in various stormwater practices so that they don't impact the school or the playing fields. So, but the biggest um, goal would be to redirect the, the runoff that's coming down the slopes so that it doesn't have the surface runoff into the, the building. And, and I think just to add, we had a great conversation with Guilford Mooring um, and his team the other day and walking the site, the, the entire site, which also includes the middle school site is, is very wet. And if anyone's been out there, you'll see that they too have put uh, kind of perimeter drains all around the middle school uh, site, even along at wherever, wherever there's been improvements, for example, at the tennis courts, there's perimeter drains all around the tennis courts to manage the stormwater. So this site is um, maybe a little, it's, it's different. It's certainly not flat. And because you do have all of the gray changes, you know, it starts up at Strong Street, comes down to the uh, Wildwood site, and then slopes down another 15 feet down to the middle school site. So um, this area as well is known for the wet soils and wet conditions. And then Mike, if you want to talk about how yeah, that impacts the site. Um, you know what they were talking about wet soils. Well, the way to think of these two sites, uh, Four River is kind of in the valley. So you get soft clays and stuff associated with the valley and you get water because you're down by the river and in the valley. Here, you're up in the hills at Wildwood. So you have a, what's a soil that's called glacial till. It's a very dense soil, very, you've seen it, it's hard pan. You'll hear people refer to it. Some of you might have it at your house. It doesn't drain very well. And so the water tends to run around along the surface and the surface tends to get wet and very muddy. And you tend to get water around your, your buildings or in parking areas and playing fields. It tends to collect because the water can't infiltrate into the ground. So uh, we also have to manage groundwater here or water. And, but the reason for that is the soils are just very tight, very impervious. The water doesn't want to drain on you and it tends to run in the surface. So there'll be engineering features to the building to collect this water uh, and to manage it. And that's what Janet was talking about. So different soil type, but basically the same problem causing same issues being caused by just a different soil and a different condition. So um, that's on groundwater. So when you see water, it'll be right at the surface and they're, they're trying to manage it. It just can't drain. So one of the issues at Wildwood is that the site in the past was, was level, it used to be a hill site. They moved soil to form the flat area adjacent to the existing school. So there's up to, I think up to 10 feet of fill on the site. Soil they just pushed into place that is highly variable, is loose in some areas. So it's not a suitable uh, bearing material for a new building and we would have to treat that soil. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of technologies that are readily available. Um, Rick and I are working on a couple sites with the same type of materials in Springfield and we've treated those very successfully. The buildings are, are, are uh, one of them they're just finishing up now or they're well along on construction and the other one is open. But basically you would, you have two options. You can treat the soil with aggregate piers, like we said, to densify it in situ, or you can dig it up and then recompact it and put it back in place in a dense, dense state. Um, both solutions are, are reasonable and are viable. Um, it's a matter of cost. So we would go through and cost that out in the 
in the design on this. Well, we, we would just need to treat the soil underneath the building. So, um, but we could make a dense bearing material and it's just how we create that. So, uh, and Rick, if you want to, you know, just kind of walk through its similar approach. You're on mute, sorry. You're muted, Rick. Yeah. Okay, same, same renovation and new construction slides here. The difference at Wildwood, because the groundwater is not quite so proximate under renovation, we wouldn't be uh, removing the existing slab uh, it didn't show up in the detail here, but we would be surface applying a vapor barrier to it <clears throat> to uh, help fend off uh, any latent moisture from, from rising up. We'd have the, the cutoff drains, as Janet said, to redirect that water that's coming down the hillside around, around the building, divert it. And new construction, it's really uh, the same, would be the same uh, situation as at Fort River, except we wouldn't be raising the overall grade. So it's adding drainage, uh, adding good uh, draining material underneath the slabs and uh, handling it that way. And then Mike, here's, here's the East Hampton High School. Um. Yeah, I think Sean had asked for an example, and, and here's a slide. Um, as you may be aware, East Hampton presently, well, in the last 10 years, they've, they've, uh, they've undergone two large school projects. The first one, which I think was about 10 years ago, was East Hampton High School uh, that we worked on. And presently, they're redoing their elementary and their middle schools. Um, you know, on Maple, I think it's... Uh, it's Park Street they're redoing. It's the White Brook Middle School and Maple Elementary Schools. They're doing, they have a large school projects. Both of them have similar conditions to uh, Fort River. So they both have soft soils, high groundwater table and uh, flat sites in a low lying area. So a lot of the things we did there are applicable to Fort River we would do. Um, they, there was some question on a job that was 10 years ago. The high school was built about 10 years ago, East Hampton High School. It's down by uh, Rubber Thread Pond if you're in the center of East Hampton. Um, very similar soil conditions. There's a geologic map and it's the schools in the little white dot. These uh, lines are the, the limits of the soft valley clay, Connecticut River Valley barb clay, these, these white lines. These swing around and they go through Amherst. They had, and Amherst sort of run along the base of University Drive, uh, UMass and downtown Amherst are in the upper till, which would be the white, and then you, in, down in the valley going towards Hadley, and then it wraps around where Fort River is. So you, you get similar contours to these. The map is similar. The soils are very, very similar at Fort River than they were at the East Hampton High School project. So we would look at a similar solution so, and you can see there's something on the, the high school. Um, what we did is we strengthened the soil with aggregate piers that allowed us to use a, a higher bearing pressure and support um, loads. This in the school, there's often some pretty heavily heavy columns well, around the library and the cafeteria and stuff. You get some concentrated loads that the structural engineer has some issues with getting out. It's, it's pretty common for schools. We treated that with aggregate piers so we could take these big building loads out and support these big loads in the building. Um, and then we, we had the soft clay. First off, we picked up the building about four feet to get it out of the, the, the low lying area in East Hampton. They built it in the swampy area right behind the previous high school. Uh, pretty common. So there was a low lying area. They built the new school in and they basically brought in four feet of fill, up to four feet of fill and filled that area in to pick up the new school. So it would be dry and they had a nice dry site for the new school without moisture. But that caused you know, the same soil, soft clay. So that caused a settlement issue. There we did what's called a soil preload. You put the soil on in advance and you let the soil settle under the load. So 
a pre it's a preload because you add additional fill to uh, to mimic the weight of the building. So you kind of pre-compress the soil to feel the weight of the new fill and feel the weight of the building. So the building, when you build it, doesn't settle. So um, we also did some some um, techniques to expedite settlement for construction issues. Um, uh, when you do school projects, Rick will tell you and Donna will tell you there's usually a drop dead date of, right? September 1st or August 15th, the school has to be open. So you have to make sure you meet that schedule. You can't let your construction schedule slide to August 15th, right? Or Thanksgiving, it just doesn't work. It has to be open at a certain date when you start. You have to set your finish date and then work backward from there. And we expedited all this process to, uh, to make sure that they met the schedule. It's worked out. This uh, East Hampton High School has uh, no noticeable settlement, no water issues. Um, the project went on construction on budget and everyone was pretty happy. So it was a, it's a very similar site to Fort River and, and this slide is only to show you it can be done. So, and that there's techniques. All right, I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah. So. Catherine. Um, yeah, this is fantastic. Um, I just wanna say it, the amount of information. So just on the preload, um, do you, you said you preload and then you mimic the weight. Is that a certain amount of time it has to sit there to be compressed? It, I'm just trying to understand what that what is. What we do is we measure it, the settlement. So if uh, I can actually send you, or I could, if you ever are interested, I could do more. If Fort River was uh, selected and we had the, uh, and we chose something like this, I could show you those plots, but you, you measure settlement with time and you wait for the settlement to end. So uh, we're adding the wick drains to make it go faster. So, so we make it and we measure it and when the settlement ends and then we take the preload off, so. It, it, Phoebe has her hand up too. Hi, Phoebe. Hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I've actually, th this has been really helpful because I think we've talked a lot about the, um, uh, site at Fort River, but not quite as much at Wildwood. And if I'm understanding correctly, there's still a significant amount of site work that would need to happen at Wildwood as well. Um, and a lot of it sounds very similar to what we'd be doing at Fort River. Um, so my questions, the couple that I have at the moment, and I'm sure I'll have more, um, have to do specifically with Wildwood. Um, how would, if we're talking about the possibility of building into one of those hills, um, how does that impact capturing the runoff? What would we need to do in that section if we're literally, you know, building into a hill? Um, Donna? I'm gonna take that, Donna. Sure, thank you. Um, so what I, I believe, I was looking at the potential of putting a retaining wall on one edge. And I think we would wanna capture the toe of the slope for, and maybe that would take like from the north, middle north, um, west over down to the southeast. But then where the retaining wall is, we would capture above the retaining wall. So there might be two lines almost in parallel, one taking the toe of slope from most of it, one at the top of the retaining wall, taking that runout that's coming down the slope before it hits the retaining wall. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, it absolutely yeah. does. And if I could also add something, there, there has been discussions about, quote, building into the hill, taking advantage of it. And uh, from a building standpoint, that's, that changes the game of, of uh, from moisture mitigation to actually hy uh, hydraulic. You're talking waterproofing instead of moisture. Now you're in a sense, whatever wall you've got into the into the hill is now a basement, and so that's a very active kind of uh, more uh, robust type of membrane that you have to protect that area for any uh, perched water that's coming down the hill and hitting that wall. So, so we have. Oh, 
if I can cut it. I just want to emphasize what Rick said. It also adds to the cost of the structure because you have the weight of the soil against the building. So the whole structure gets a little bit more expensive. There's more concrete, more steel in it. So it does add expense when you go into the hillside. Go ahead, Phoebe. Sorry, we... you're, you're muted. Phoebe, you're Sorry. muted. Judy. <laughs> <laughs> that, like at least that was <laughs> muted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I actually think that's very helpful. Is this, um, I, I have another question about the, the runoff and that kind of stuff, but because you just mentioned that, is that something that we're um, working to put into our cost? Because we had talked about building into the hill. Is this something that we're going to be kind of assessing, assessing and looking at further in cost and everything else? Yes, yeah, so we've, and um, further along, we start talking about the floor plans and how they relate to the site and the community access. We're finding that it's probably gonna be very challenging to build into the hill in a meaningful manner because what we would be putting into the hill are the classrooms because the community wing wants to be the front of the building with the parking and access and the administration so that we can close off the, the um, classroom wing, the academic wing behind it. So building into the hill probably won't work only because we need daylight, we need natural light in the classrooms um, and other projects that we've done, we have been able to successfully build into the hill, but the topography and where the hill was in relationship to the rest of the site was, was totally different. And so um, it doesn't look like there'll be a beneficial um, design opportunity and to, to even do that. And then you have the added cost. So I think at this point, we would recommend against building any further into the hill. Um, you'll see some of our designs that are still not done, but, but we will incorporate the retaining wall and all of the stormwater management that is required to do that. But we're not going to um, go further deeper into the hill at this point. Kathy? Um, yeah, just building off of Phoebe's comments um, so far, I mean, I know you're going to give us some of the site pictures later, you know, with the uh, classrooms in it, but um, you've, you've shown a new building that is the same for either Fort River or um, Wildwood. And so one of my questions is on new uh, to avoid the hill issue and avoid the retaining wall, could it, it uh, not be straight back? Could it be more of an L L shape? So it's that's a question, you know, that we don't have to, it's easy on paper to say it's exactly the same. Um, but then the second question, um, if you can go down to the ad reno, the ad reno looks really is a nice fit on uh, Wildwood. Um, on the Wildwood site, you don't have to go over into the hill at all. Um, you've got room if we go for the groundwater wells, you've got room for the wells and it looks like you get daylight. So I just think when we, when we come back to what you've talked about ground condition, it also interacts with um, not just choice of site, but choice of uh, what seems to work well on each site. Just, and the other thing I saw on the, I hadn't really thought of this until I walked Wildwood again, and I walked it with another counselor who thinks about slope. Um, it takes advantage that Wildwood right now is on a nice flat place so that you, it's already taken advantage of the bowl. So the ad reno fits better that way too. You know, you don't bring it, I think Phoebe, you were the one of asking how close to the hill are we, you know, down, you don't have to bring it the new, you don't have to bring the new wing as far south. So these are just things I was looking at as you were talking about ground and other conditions that I think must affect the cost of the building. Um, so it interacts with the price tag as well. Yeah, so so just a couple of things, and it's fine this is interactive. This um, is, this is preferred than us just 
um, presenting. If uh, absolutely, you know, there are ways to kink the building, you know, you know, in certain ways, our focus has been to maximize north south um, orientation for the classrooms to maximize and control the daylighting. But we certainly there are opportunities to perhaps um, reconfigure it so it's not in a straight line. The other conversation that we did have, we call it kind of a wraparound conversation with some of the departments in Amherst, and we had the fire department there. And we did ask what the requirement was for uh, 360 degree access around the building. And how important is that? Um, they, they stated that that's not a deal breaker. You know, if we can get to the end of the building, uh, to the end of, a, of the long portion of the north side and the south side of the building, they don't necessarily require access all the way around the building. So, you know, we can certainly look at how to maximize the site and, and take advantage of the site instead of building into the hill as, as we move forward. But for now, it's probably prudent to carry the high retaining wall for cost comparisons and also managing the stormwater on the site. Phoebe? Unmuted this time. Um, so in terms of the, the runoff in the stormwater, um, you said that there was already a culvert from sort of across the road back that sort of went into the onto the middle school site. I'm assuming that we would have to do, um, and I think it may have been mentioned something similar. My, my question is, does that bring yet another agreement with the regional, with the region, because it's, it would be uh, onto the middle school site? No, um, Janet, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the existing culvert, we would pretty much leave intact. We would probably video it to make sure that um, it was in structurally sound, but we would not impact it. The, um, but most of the site does already drain towards um, the middle school site. So we would uh, mimic the existing pattern and the stormwater, the Massachusetts stormwater handbook basically says that you need to, um, you cannot increase your post-development runoff from your pre-development runoff. So we would just do the same thing that it is currently doing um, separate from the culvert, it, it seems to be a lot of the runoff on Wildwood gets caught in catch basins and um, various drainage pipes and gets into that tan brook, which is maybe culverted underneath um, that slope and towards the tennis courts. But I don't think that's an, an additional agreement if we're not increasing or we're not actually changing the structures. Yeah, so we, as long as we keep the existing structures I, I don't see that as an another agreement. Yeah, I, our, our goal is not to disturb the culvert, Phoebe, Phoebe, if that's your question. And then, and then the other just clarifying point, Janet, tell me if I'm incorrect. Um, you were saying that we have to manage the water um, as it currently flows, but we also cannot um, increase or decrease the rate in which it flows off the site. So we don't want to accelerate, right? Janet, the we cannot increase it. We can decrease it. So it's okay to decrease, decrease the, the flow, the, the flow, the, the flow of it. But we cannot increase it, which is why we would have uh, some type of stormwater practice like the bioretention areas, gravel wetlands, detention basin areas that would contain water for longer. So it might have a continuous flow offsite, but it would. Um, not increase the flow of site. It might and, yeah, I guess I guess the only other thing to point out at both sites, right? Um, it, it we will be um, most definitely, I'll say most um, that will be reducing the impervious area again, given the size of the existing building and all of the existing parking. So, depending on the yeah, depending on the final layout. I know what we originally looked at um, Fort River site, it did seem to be reducing impervious. The Wildwood site, um, 
when we did our analysis, it was the larger building footprint and there was a little bit of an increase, but um, I think with the smaller footprint, we won't right. increase. So therefore it will be, a, it'll be the stormwater design will be a little Same. bit easier. <laughs> You know, I'm curious, Tammy's on, you know, we've had people who live in these schools, um, whether there are any comments on a, um, in terms of structural or Rupert Ben, um, just making sure we get any questions, comments, thoughts on, um, I don't live in either school. <laughs> Tammy. Sure. Um you know, having lived in Fort River, so to speak, for um, 18 years, I, I have to say I, I am concerned because I, I see the effects of the rainwater on, on the roof, um, the amount of effort we have to put in when the ground is so saturated that the water comes up through the ground. So I just want to ensure that the build, the accommodations that are being made to either site are, are forward thinking in that in 30 to 50 years, we're to the best of our ability and to our most current knowledge accounting for potential water table increases. Um, because it's stressful for teachers, for administrators, uh, for students to have to live with water, um, you know, right now when there's heavy rains, we have to put uh, plastic uh, drop coverings over books. Um, so it, you know, it, it, it does sort of cast a wide, a wide web when we have to worry about uh, drainage and, and water affecting so our schools and ability to learn. Yeah, Tammy, just on that note, when you're saying you have to put plastic to cover your books, are you, are you saying the books are on the ground or you're getting water infiltrated from the ceiling or we're getting yeah we're getting water infiltrated from the ceiling and i know right now we're, we're considering sort of the the water that's coming underneath the high water table but it's still a consideration yeah of course a any um new construction is going to have the appropriate roof drainage and and everything else and i, I don't I should know, but I offhand I don't when the last time the roof has been replaced and if if there's leaks that may be occurring, which really have when it rains, it rains, right? So um, you know that 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 hopefully will be managed. Um, obviously we'll have roof drains and and of course uh, a warrantied roof that will be 25 to 30 years. I'm All right. I don't see any other hands yeah. up. Um, uh, Phoebe's hand is up. Yep. I think I always do that to you, Kathy. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's just it's it's, it's your for whatever reason your hand is in a place on your yeah, wall yeah. that it's harder it's to see. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so my question is. Um, all of these, all of the site work, I think they were, you know, when we were talking about the not realistic costs before, when we had that very preliminary sort of sketch of them, um, we had included a lot of these site costs into Fort River. When we, when this is handed to the um, cost estimators kind of this time around in the next month, um, will all of this information go to them? I'm, I'm trying to figure out if we'll end up with a more apples to apples co site costs on the next round of um, potential cost. Yes, uh, go ahead, Rick. I, I, I don't wanna use the term apples to apples, but for each, each scheme, the cost estimator will be figuring into his cost the appropriate uh, basis of design for each site. So Fort River would be raising the grade where Wildwood does not include raising the grade. So it's not a pure apples to apples, but it will be a uh, more detailed uh, takeoff of the engineered designed responses to the individual conditions at each site. Yeah, I mean, Phoebe, the really short answer is 
everything that the engineers and architects understand about these two sites will be incorporated, which isn't to say that there isn't a lot more development. So they're making educated guesses about some things, but everything that's being discussed today will be incorporated. Yeah. And, and again, just going back to the initial conversations of why is the site at Fort River so much larger or so much more expensive than the Wildwood site, um, we still have a much larger area that we will be managing and reconstructing or replacing. So that, you know, won't go away, right? That, that won't change. And so I think it will still demonstrate that the Fort River site will probably be more expensive than the Wildwood. So uh, Paul's hand is up, Paul. I see Tammy's hand up too, Kathy. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure whether Tammy just hadn't lowered it. Okay. Gonna... Yeah, it's, um, thank you. You said um, that you had talked with the fire department and the public works, you know, and I wondered if you, there were any insights that our town engineers had brought to you in terms of um, their sort of on the ground consideration of the of the two sites. Uh, just to clarify, Paul, are you asking what what their opinions are of the if there was anything sites? anything that you know you, you sort of do a you know a, a sort of a scientific review of the site based right. on soils and things like that, but then they they're out there every day walking the sites and managing right, their space. observations. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, in this, in this, I think we sort of asked this of Rupert and Ben as well because they're in, in the same situation. Yes, thank you. It, it was a great meeting um, with DPW, um, again, Guilford and his team. And they just reiterated that the Fort River site is wet. Um, there, there's no question, no one, every, everyone is acknowledging it. So the good news is we know how to manage that site. They also acknowledge that there are significant issues at the Wildwood site as it relates to stormwater and drainage. And so when we started talking about the mitigation measures, you know, we just received a lot of nods, understanding that yes, those, those are the appropriate measures to manage and improve both sites. These, these would be improvements um, to, to either site. And it was actually Guilford and Jason that elaborated on how what the um, middle school site is and how challenging it is to manage the water on that site. And we'll, we'll get into traffic at the next meeting, but they also had a lot of insight as to the traffic at both locations. And the, Paul, the discussion with the uh, fire prevention officer had to do with access and expectations and uh, they basically said they were going to be reasonable. Uh, there are times when the building code requires you to have uh, 360 degree fire truck access all the way around the building, depending on how you try to build the building. We tried to avoid that requirement. Uh, sometimes they ask for simply being able to get an ambulance on a paved play service to, to uh, get to a kid and uh, you know what we're showing here is not the road for a ladder truck but they said they were they will work with us and be pragmatic on the type of access for to emergency built uh, vehicles we can give give them good I just want to make sure their um, thoughts are being considered thank you yes thank yeah. you and and yeah. there'll be many more conversations with them. Donna, just did you, I didn't, uh, on Conservation Commission, I think you met with them too in this group meeting. Were there any, um, I'm assuming that's floodplain conservancy, were there any issues in terms of either site on the CONCOM review? No, I, I believe it was the agent um, that we met with and, or she was present and they, pretty much just confirmed everything that we said as far as the floodplain um, being pulled back 
on the Fort River site, and that that is anticipated to occur. They said later in the year. I think it was. It, it's in the works, but it won't officially be done till I think August or September. Yeah. Rick or Margaret. Yeah. 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 But um, they they understand as well and and agree that the floodplain conservancy kind of trumps everything else. When you look at this slide, this is the the most extreme into the site, into the school. And and did so in 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 uh, when Janet was talking about moving wet moving creating new wetlands, uh, removing some wetlands that would that. Does that all go through Conservation Commission too? You know, with a set of, you know, you can do this and you can just on. I'm just looking for when when you build part of your home in Amherst, what it's noted for is how many hurdles you hit. <laughs> with our, we hit them all. We hit them all here. But, but go ahead, Janet. Any any work within the hundred foot buffer of any wetland resource area requires meeting with the Conservation Commission and obtaining an order of conditions. So. Um, I believe both of these sites would definitely require meeting and originally the Fort River, I mean the Fort River site was very obvious, the Wildwood site, the wetlands were not as obvious, but they did um, bring attention to Tan Brook, which is coverted, but all, but, but in their mind is still um, a resource area, so okay. we would um, meet with them to discuss the Tan Brook. Also, so some of the uh, intersection work that might be considered which was a a traffic circle or something up at the entrance gets close to the pond on the north side of the road and that and that gets to be jurisdictional so just just for everyone else's benefit when we were speaking with the dpw they were suggesting a way to mitigate some of the traffic at wildwood would be to create a very small roundabout up here at the intersection and so again recognizing here's the tan brook or the pond i guess is is up here that we we have to be mindful of that pb thanks um so because we are just um you know still talking about the wetness i'm wondering if the middle school field site for the for the has there Thermal been thermal wells yeah yeah, has there been a, an evaluation of that field there specifically? And does anything have to happen to that in order to make all of the other things work at Wildwood that we need it to? Does it have to come up, any of those sorts of things? No, so like at Fort River, um, there's a way to mitigate the high groundwater for the geothermal fields. And it's our understanding that it is a nominal increase in the construction, but the wells can be constructed in these uh, conditions. So that, that isn't a consideration. The consideration more so uh, as we evaluate the ground, so, so if it's ground source heat pumps um, and we need a geothermal field, if we do locate it down in the middle school, field down here, two conversations need to occur. One is what kind of memor memorandum of agreement would we have, what needs to be done in order to satisfy MSBA that we have control of the site. We're, we're thinking maybe it's just an easement, right? Just like any other utility that, that that might work. The other consideration is if this field it, the intent of the field is to be used by the Wildwood School during school, we now have to make this accessible and it's a 15 foot slope. So we would have to create an accessible ramp system to get down to the bottom of the field. That, if, that's one of the things that Guilford and Jason expounded on when they were working on the uh, Safe Walk project that there was once uh, accessible access considered from upper to lower field, and it basically stretched from the tennis courts to the uh, preschool traffic circle, the length that you needed to get it to work. And so that, that's a big challenge. So another opportunity here would be 
to thank the middle school for allowing us to put the geothermal wells under here, improve the conditions because it is wet um, so that the community has better access and use of the site and then just connect the wells to where the, to the, where the new building or, or renovated building would go and just not claim the use of that space for the Wildwood students during school. Pippi, did your hand go back up or did it just not come down? Um, okay. Can I expand on that just for one minute? Um, as far as the stormwater goes, as we said, um, for the Fort River site, we could not increase um, the runoff going from the Wildwood site to the middle school site. However, um, I believe that the um, town engineer and um, the DPW superintendent would want the culvert that's basically containing Tanbrook to be videoed to be sure that it's structurally sound. And that's what we would be tying into. So if the culvert is the is the store is the wetness concern, we won't be increasing wetness to the actual fields. So that would be a separate issue if the town is concerned about the fields on the Wildwood site that we're not actually touching. But um, the culvert would be something that we would probably be tying into and they would want to make sure that it's structurally sound all the way through. And Janet, they suggested that also for Fort River, right? The, the, the yes. one up by the parking lot, yeah. Yeah, because they said it for Fort River, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that they would require right. it for this one. The difference um, for the two sites is that we would be daylighting and improving the, the culvert at the Fort River site and, and kind of creating opening it up, making it more of an educational or, or site feature, where here we just need to carry the water through the culvert. I'm looking to see, I don't see any other hands up. So um, we could, if, if it's okay with everyone, we can conclude the questions um, and what we have Mike and Janet here. Um, if there are other questions after um, that come up, we will, we will send them through Donesco to them to get answers for everybody. Um, so if things occur to you after the fact, or as a result of thinking through this, we'll, we'll just do them through. So, so Janet, do you, I mean, Donna, do you want to, uh, should we be thanking Janet? Sure. I mean, you guys are happy to stay, and 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 I know you guys are. They, our team really works collaboratively together, Kathy, and and having them understand the nuances of what's important in the building and what goes where sometimes helps inform sure. um, their work. They're free to go. It's nine forty-seven. So if you guys have to run or if you'd like to hang out, that that's great. <laughs> I leave it to you. Um, so, so what we wanted to do is we want to just touch base on where we are with the layout of the building. And I want to say thank you to the school department. We had a great meeting Thursday before Good Friday. So these, the staff was great to stick around. Uh, we met with the special ed teams. They, they were great to stick around and, and really provide some thoughtful inputs as far as the locations of the district-wide SPED programs and the adjacencies and how different layouts of the school impact the integration of these programs with, with their peers. And that's a really important consideration. Um, as we know, these spaces and, and needs for the special ed, which is in kind of the darker purple here, is not insignificant. And we want to make sure that they're integrated when it's appropriate, what kind of accommodations do they need, et cetera. So it, it was a great conversation. And in addition to that, I don't, yes, I think, I think we reported back last time that Mike and, and some of his team actually came out to Springfield to the Brightwood School and, and toured the school as it related to what does a three-story building feel like? And also they have 
uh, a few low incidence programs or, or um, district wide SPED programs in their schools. And so they just wanted to get a feel and a sense of the integration and how that functions, especially in a multi story building. So everyone has seen the spatial relationship organization. And again, as we were saying earlier, how the layout of the building impacts the site and what you can and can't do with the site. Um, it's our understanding that the cafeteria and the gymnasium are to be zoned in a way that are for community access. And then the media center isn't as great of a community resource as it is for the school. So our goal is to have the cafeteria and the gymnasium. There's a stage and we have art and music also sort of attached to kind of a STEM-like uh, grouping over here that at least the music and the practice rooms utilizing the stage for overflow needs for music, but also maybe acting as a green room or something for the stage and cafetorium for community use and performances. And then what's in purple are all of the academic spaces and the green um, is for the administration and support. So we looked at, and, and I think everyone has it for the, um, just being mindful of time today, we had three different layouts for a three-story new school option. And working with the team, it was decided that a simple layout such as this works best. It is the most efficient. It has the smallest footprint and it allows for the maximum integration of special ed, but also for collaboration among the teams and grades, as well as vertical collaboration. So just to walk through, here would be the main entry. This is the first floor. We're, we're working on taking the music and the practice and incorporating it down on the first floor to be connected with cafetorium and stage. The gymnasium would be at the front of the school, there's an elevator at, at the entrance as well. And we could, you know, block off the, the rest of the school going, going west or left um, to the purple from community access. What, what, was, what people liked about this option is that there are classrooms on uh, across the hall from each other with built in with the project area. So there is cross collaboration for the grade. So everyone can, can be, be seen and be heard. Um, and, then, and then there's another grade associated with it. So typically you would have kindergarten and first grade. So there's a vertical collaboration that occurs between the two grades. And that was very attractive. There was one scheme that actually had grades on opposite sides of the community wing. And while that was attractive, making a small school feel, they felt that these grades would actually become more isolated in, instead of being a collaborative um, feature. And then again, we talked about the locations of the special ed programs, the AIMS, the, um, 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 it's a Friday, the intensive needs or the ILC, as well as help me out, uh, the behavioral program. So we spent a lot of time talking about that organization. So what we're doing is, you know, the X's are where they're double height. So you'll see we're gonna actually for the gym and we're gonna try to get some extra height on the cafeteria, but those two spaces would be on the first floor. And then on the second and third floors, we have the media center, the library, a STEM and an art room if we can move the music um, downstairs. And again, very simple um, as far as construction costs are concerned, always being mindful where we can have consistent um, construction occurring at every level that it's a simplified construction method that is going to um, minimize the cost of construction. So everyone um, believed that, that this concept, right, it, it's the separation of community and academic 
It's the collaboration, the integration, and it also provides program flexibility. So these are, for the most part, all full-size classrooms. So, you know, the AIMS program could be located in a different location if it deemed appropriate going forward, right? It will be designed exactly the same as a general classroom. It also has the smallest footprint, so it increases time on learning. Um, going vertically actually is less time than having to walk 300 feet to one end of the building or another. Elisa. Um, thank you. I just have a quick question. So when you say everyone liked this option, who are you uh, referring to? So I'm sorry, the, the teams that, that were at the meeting. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, so this was um, Mike, Morris, the superintendent, um, and the um, special ed teachers um, as related to the low incidence or, or the SPED programs, as well as uh, Joanne, who is um, works with the, that group. So staff from Wildwood and Fort River? Yes. And Tammy's here nodding her head, too. Thank you, Tammy. So, and again, um, you know, these are diagrammatic and as Kathy was saying, well, can we just kink the buildings? Can we, can we move them a little bit? The answer is yes. Um, we can try to make them more dynamic or fit the site. And as you can see, we have the academic on the West and the community on the East, you know, we would flip them as it related to the sites. And then instead of maybe one long linear building, if we could, you know, kink it a little bit or, or make it fit the site, we'll certainly do that. But this is for organizational purposes. Um, I see both Angela and Kathy. Yeah, take take Ange Angelica. Angelica, Kirk. sorry, Angelica. No worries. Uh, Donna, so I, um, I wanted to ask you about a movement between the different floors. Uh, and so I, it's hard to see on my computer, on my laptop, where uh, students would say mobility issues and how they would access the different floors, uh, if it's just going to be stairways or if there's other mechanisms for access. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have stairways, and that actually is important as far as circulation goes with managing students, 575 students. But for those that have mobility issues, we have an elevator. And the elevator is actually, you need a key to access it. So not all students can just decide they were tired on a Friday and just wanna take the elevator, right? So they would have to be accompanied by a teacher or an adult. But we have the elevator located near the main entry and they could take it up. It would be in the exact same location on every floor. And we did have a long conversation about the benefits of that. Um, the goal, because for example, the ILC, there are three classrooms that it was determined it would be preferred to have the students in those classrooms along with their peers. So instead of having all three ILC classrooms on the first floor, you have one that, that meets the needs of kindergarten first and then second, third and fourth, fifth. And we understand the students might shift from year to year, but this also gives you the most flexibility. Kathy? Uh, yeah, building, um, when Alicia said who, who was in the room looking at these, um, my question is on timing. I know we need a preferred solution. So which site, is it ad reno or new? And if we went new and said, it's gonna be three story, this design still is in movement, isn't it after June? You know, in terms of, um, you know, other teachers, community. Um, in, so you, you need the footprint of the building, the volume of the building, but so, so it's, it, let me frame it as a question. You know, this is whatever is the concept some of the rooms could change around as more of us, because I haven't focused a lot and I wouldn't probably know enough <laughs> to, to figure out where anything should be other than a decision, Jim on the first floor cafeteria in terms of what is community. Is that correct that this, when we go into the next stage is where there's still room for movement on 
the floor layouts? Um, there is to a certain extent. I, I think <clears throat> what's going to be important and and I think, you know, we were talking about this meeting or two meetings ago, what was important for community access, because we really need to consider where those spaces go and, and how we design those and incorporate that into the cost, right? So, yep. so it was our understanding that, it, that the cafetorium and the gym would be used for community use. And then for the most part, the rest of the building would be for academic use only. And so the input more so, it's more important to make sure from uh, the academic perspective that it functions, it gets all of the natural light. Um, the even even Rupert with, you know, where does the receiving go? Where how how do we manage recycling all of that? So the inner workings of it really come down to what works best for the for the school department. Um, but yes, we we are not done. This is if we have a direction, this will be great that we can move forward and and we can still man, manipulate, I guess, the, the spaces and the locations, but it's a very simple plan, um, as you can see. And what's important to the school department is that each grade um, remains clustered and they do want to have a collaboration with the grade above or below. So, and then, and then the integration of SPED. So you'll see there's probably not a, a lot of opportunity for redesign per se. And again, we have to be mindful that we cannot exceed the program area that's been uh, approved as well as the 1.5 grossing factor. So taking all of that into consideration as we start moving some of the pieces around is what we all need to be mindful of. So there's Phoebe and then Alicia. Um, so kind of a two part question, as usual, um, when you went through this last week or the week before, um, was it just based on this three story layout? Did they have the opportunity to look at the two story layout? Um, and then second part of that, um, have the general education teachers taken a look at this and, and, you know, at both two and three as well? So thank you. Um, we did go through the with with more than just the special ed um, staff, the concepts of the different um, two story and three story buildings. And I'm going to just share with you, I, I did have them. Um, what you'll see here is, let me just, we did go through these and, and we've gone through and have talked about the benefits and perhaps um, negative considerations for each of the options. And we, we can continue to refine them, um, but, but from you know, the administrator's administrative perspective that these have benefits, but yet at the same time, they don't allow for the collaboration and the integration of the special ed programs, which is really important. So, so just as an example on this, we have what's in purple, right? So it's twofold. One is you want to have, we have five classrooms per grade. So we need to have five classrooms clustered together. So you can see here's one grade. And then on the opposite side of the core op, uh, components, we have another grade. What's important is the integration of the special ed programs. And so when you start putting those together, you have, let's just say this a building blocks, got it. Okay, so when you start pulling these together, for example, if you have the ILC program, say in the kindergarten wing, just as an example, it could be first grade, the students that it serves for the first grade actually have quite a long distance to go and they're not as integrated as they are with, with their peers. Um, and, and that was sort of a, the resounding feeling as it related to special ed programs. The other components are there are other services that are not just for these um, 
low incidence programs, but they also serve a, a greater population, which also are not as convenient and easily accessible for all students. Um, the other consideration, one, one of the benefits they liked is this is a really great small school feel. Every grade has its own pod. Every grade gets to, you know, kind of celebrate itself. But what that does is it also isolates them. And so the educators felt that the isolation trumps the small school feel so that you don't have the collaboration between grades. And they even went as far as saying, you know, isn't it great, you know, to have the first graders walking through and the kindergartners see, oh, wow, next year I'm going to be a first grader and the collaboration and, and also with the staff. Um, I know Tammy's on the call. I don't know if you want to jump in, Tammy. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree with everything that Donna said. I think she you captured every all the remarks, uh, both the positive and the concerns that the teams that you've met with. Um, I think there's been a lot of careful consideration about um, what the level of collaboration, both vertically and horizontally, that we want for all of our students as well as our staff. Um, and so I think the concept number one, while sort of met all of our criteria the best in terms of our low incidence population, but then also in terms of our collaboration, um, that we hope to be able to continue um, into the future. And then I'll just quickly share with you, we started to, to look at a different way to take advantage of your beautiful sites and, and create light and natural daylight in the project areas. But we're still going to continue to explore how we can maximize daylight, but but as we started laying this out, you can see it, it becomes a challenge as far as the collaboration of the grades. And it also made the building much larger. And we have to be careful that A, the spaces function, but that we don't exceed the grossing factor. So, um, and utilizing some of these areas by putting some of the small group spaces or other special ed requirements, um, people felt that they don't want the students to be walking through a project area to access those as those kids would then be looked at and saying, oh, they're going into the, the speech and language pathologist room or, or, or they need extra help. So some of it is also protecting those students. And so we sort of want to combine concept three with concept one in a way that we can bring in more natural light. So there's a, a better connection to the outdoors, but we also have to be mindful of the 1.5 grossing factor. So, and, and that the spaces need to function. We could say, okay, well, let's, let's make these project areas smaller, but that, that in reality ends up um, not being able to provide all of the lockers or, or cubbies and they would be so narrow that they wouldn't be functional. So there are implications. Donna, I think Phoebe asked about two-story. Oh, and, and that two-story, uh, yeah, we did have that too. More so, so the Donna, did they get to weigh in on yeah. two-story versus three? Yep, yep. So the two-story was also similar. Thank you. Um, as you can see, all, all of this taking into consideration that we have to meet the 1.5 grossing factor, right? So, so that's a really important component when you start laying out the buildings and making sure that there isn't a lot of excess. When we say the grossing factor, that includes toilets, but the corridors take up a large part of that. And so the longer the buildings, the, the, you'll see this really started creating um, larger areas. So the way to, to consolidate and not make this a very long linear building, which wouldn't even fit at either site, we looked at creating these pods. So the hub and the core is the gym and the cafetorium with the music. Upstairs would be the uh, library and a STEM area or a STEAM area up, upstairs. 
but again, similar to one of those other options we, sh we showed you that the footprint's quite large. So it's great that everyone would have a short distance to the core, but this even feels a little more isolating when you have students perhaps say in the West, West Wing um, and they need to obtain services in another wing. And so there really wasn't much of a benefit from time on learning. It actually can decrease some of the time on learning if you have to go from a special ed service from one, one pod to another. Um, it, it is the shortest to get to the core spaces, but it also is the smallest footprint. Uh, I mean, the, it, max, it takes up the most footprint and you can see it's pretty tight to fit on the sites. Um, so for those benefits, again, the collaboration among grades, uh, the vertical collaboration and somewhat isolation of each of the grades was a reason why they, they really felt a three-story building function much better academically. Did, do you have, you, it, the last bullet says 10% more expensive. Do you have um, hard numbers behind that? Yeah, I, um, so- I mean, hard, num hard numbers. You know? Hard numbers, right. <laughs> well, we, we have numbers. Um, so, so, you know, some of the costs really relate to um, increase in the foundations. Um, there's extra costs, there's more foundations, uh, as well as the um, exterior enclosure. There's a, a little bit more of that. Uh, the roof area is larger. Um, we, you know, other things such as the interior, there's not much difference. The stairs, we, we need more stairs here. So we needed an, an, an additional stair for this. So that adds some additional costs. Um, and then, you know, the mechanical equipment, all of that pretty much remains the same. So it's the structure, it's the roof, it's, it's the stairs, those types of things that will really add to it. And then you also have all of the implications that we need to do at both sites, right? There's gonna be more area. So there's more site work that needs to be done. Rick, I, I don't know if there's, if I missed anything. Oh, that's, that's pretty much it. The, uh, there are uh, lines of, uh, and the, I just add that our estimator says that single stories buildings are, are more ex expensive. Even more expensive, too. right. So there's an inherent compactness and efficiency in a three-story building that doesn't exist on one and two-story buildings. And I think people are tuned into thinking that while a, a column is holding up more weight for a three-story building than it would be for a one and two, but it's actually more efficient to have a foundation under that column for multiple stories than it is just to have more smaller ones. And that pretty much carries through everything. Thank you. Um, I see Alicia's hand is up. And so I don't want to take her time. I just, so, but that 10%, the preliminary design program, if we took 10% and multiplied it times the numbers we've seen already, we're talking about that kind of increase in price. So it would probably be 10% for the, well, just the building. It, it wouldn't be, just, for the building. The, yeah, you could see the building. There's, you know, a okay. little more site that, that of course we have to okay. manage the site a little bit more, but. Okay, no, thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you. So my question is just like slightly similar to CB's, but I'm interested in, in knowing like who all we have considered input from um, because like I understand and don't disagree that it's important to hear from the school department, but to me, because we're being presented this as this is their favorite option, like it seems to me that we are putting them above all other people who we would be considering input from. And so I'm wondering 
will we hear from other teachers? I personally think it's very important to hear from students because while we will have the teachers teaching in the building and the staff working in the building, this building is for our students and that is who will benefit most from it and we need their input um, and other community members. And I don't see how we're taking those things into consideration here, which is very problematic for me. Um, and so I also think that while I'm, I'm happy to hear that this is the preferred option of some staff, and I don't even know which staff weighed into that. Um, I I don't think that that sh I don't think that should have pre been presented to us in that way. Um, and I think we should be able to see all of the concept options and more for the two story. So we have like all of these different concepts for a three story and different arrangements and placements for the classrooms, and we don't have that for the two story option. Um, so I think that that's important to have, and also. <clears throat> I'm wondering how we will take other people's input into consideration in this process and like what our plan is for that. So um, Alicia, can I respond? You know, I think that's exactly why the community forum is sort of the next public meeting. You know, obviously this information is something that the building committee looks at first and sort of gets a chance to comment about, but that is that is the purpose of the community forum. And, but I think what you're saying, Alicia, is take the word preferred off of this and show several, correct? Yes, yes. Sure. I, I have a problem with the preferred because we haven't taken, like maybe we could call it preferred if we have all of these different streams of input and we're taking all of them into consideration. But to me, this is a very biased way to present it and we're favoring the view of the school department, which I'm not saying we shouldn't take that into consideration because it is very important, but it is not the only important voice or stakeholders in this very important decision that we're making. And so I think we need to take all of those into consideration before we call it a preferred layout. Sure. Um, because again, I still don't even know who all we got input from to make this decision. Um, and then also just because we've, I, I understand we have community forums and I think those are very important. Um, but in the beginning, we also talked about like extensive community outreach and all of these ideas that we have not done anything, none of them. Um, and also we've had community forums previously prior to this and we haven't used any of that input. And so I want to know like, what is our plan moving forward after that we get the input from the community forum, how are we going to be incorporating those things into the decisions we make? Because right now it feels like to me, we have the forums and then we just keep moving. So, so a, a few things, just, just to respond to who the all are. Um, the school department and Tammy's on the call can, um, we have had and several opportunities for staff to join um, these conversations that the challenge that we're faced with is that they're staff and they have to teach during the day and um, they, they, their day ends, I think at 3.30, Tammy. So, so it's been offered and shared with everyone to please attend. And we did not have a majority of staff attend any of the visioning sessions. We did not have a majority of the staff attend a couple of these other conversations that we've had. So they are asked to attend and we have also, you know, stayed late for them. Um, so I think right now the challenge is finding time in their day so that they can come and provide additional input. I know that they've, they've seen and have, have um, seen these concepts and have, I, I believe we've asked for input and Tammy's nodding her head. So we're doing the outreach that we can and it's people's choices to come and be heard or provide the information that they feel is important to them. Um, so, but you know, I also would like to say it would be great. I think we have not dismissed community's input. Um, we have heard from the community. We have um, incorporated a lot of their thoughts and ideas. A lot of them are, were automatically included in our designs, not a lot of natural light, um, minim, you know, maximize the site, make sure that it doesn't, that it's not wet. So 
I take a little exception to the say that we have not listened and have not incorporated the community's input into this. Um, perhaps what we can do to make that a little more transparent going forward would be to say, this is what we've heard and this is where it is in the, in the project. But we absolutely take what the community says um, seriously and we do incorporate what they say. If there are reasons why they can't be done, we, we explain that. Now we explain it maybe in this forum as opposed to in a community forum, but a lot of the conversations that we've heard um, are, are the same. And so what, what is being brought up here has also been brought up at the community forums. I oh, thank you. And I just wanted to say, I thank you for that, um, Donna, because I, I do see some of the things, but also to me, some of the things are like a given, like, of course, we're not going, we're going to ensure that the site is not extra wet, because if we're building a school, I, I feel like some of those things are given natural light, like maximizing natural light. I feel like that's another thing that generally like who is going to say they don't want that. Um, and so other things and just how we're incorporating those things. I think those are decisions we could have made without the community input. Um, and so in what ways are we making sure that the things we're hearing in the forum that we may not have thought of before are being taken into consideration moving mm -hmm. forward? Because I don't see that we have a process for that. So I'm not saying like, this is something we haven't done, but like, what is our process for ensuring? So I do like the idea of saying like, these are the things we heard and this is how it is displaying in the building. I think that's a very helpful way to set it up because that would be more of like a process that we can set up to sort of track these kinds of things. Um, and then also I think it's like very unfair to say that people have a choice to contribute when meetings are being put at a time where they cannot participate. Um, and so we talked about doing other things like having surveys or having written feedback or what other ways we could reach out to people. And that's what I meant by like, we are not doing the things because we talked about how um, ineffective it could be to have meetings at certain times when people are parents also, and not just educators is not their only identity. Um, and also just different abilities people have. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're choosing not, they don't wanna be a part of this and that they're actively making that choice, but sometimes it's really just not possible. And so yeah. what avenues, other avenues are we creating for people to be able to have input um, is more what I meant by that. So, so for the staff, um, we, we totally recognize that's a challenge, right? They, they teach until 2.45 and then, and then you know, they, their day ends at 3.30. And so we have tried to have these, tried to have these meetings occur, you know, at the end of the school day until 3.30. Some have chosen to stay longer. Others have said that they had to leave. Um, I also believe the school department has reached out to, to staff, and I can confirm with Mike that that did occur, to also request any input that people may have. So um, as, as far as reaching out to the community, um, if you know, we're doing these evening um, community forums, and we did actually have a, have a morning visioning session, and that Unfortunately, um, I think we had less people attend that one than we did the evening forums, but we're available um, at any time if, if there are other times or ways to reach out to folks, we're certainly available to do that. And, and maybe some input from you all as to when uh, it would make sense, that would be great. I'm uh, conscious of time, Donna, and we have three more people with their hands up, and I do want to leave time for public comment. Um, Tammy, you don't have to take your hand down. Um, so Angelica, then Phoebe, and Tammy had her hand up also. So um, it sounds like we're at the start of a, a, a longer discussion, and we need to think of some strategies. But Angelica. I'll try to make my comments brief, but it's also to... Um, just continue the conversation and uh, about community outreach. I think it's important to contextualize that it's not just an issue about timing and people's accessibility. As an educator myself, it's um, there's a lot of burnout right now and we have to contextualize that we've gone through several COVID like waves 
including at the beginning of the semester or the, or the year, the Omicron wave. So it's about the timing of when things are being asked, which is that people are already super strained. I think now with spring coming and better weather, there's a great opportunity to like retake some of these conversations when the timing before was really hard because there's so many, so much being asked of people to just hold it together so we can just keep going. Um, I think this is a perfect time. I also like the idea. I'm new to the committee and I, I would like to see, you know, um, some of these ideas that it looks like they've been um, put forward in the past, like surveys. I know we have a farmer's market that could be a great outreach mechanism. And I know that accessibility in a variety of languages will be important. So if there's a possibility of getting an FAQ or some kind of simple handout that can be given to people and, and like say the farmer's market translated also in Spanish, that would really, really help benefit increasing like the transparency and communication on these issues and building more community input and community consensus on the project. Thank you. Phoebe? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna follow Alicia and, uh, and Angelica pretty quickly. I, I wanna also recommend, I mean, uh, all of these things are on paper already, theoretically, I mean, on our screens on paper. Um, so it might be worth sending to, and I don't know how it works, sending to staff on paper for written feedback. They can see the options, they can think about it, they can do it at their own time, and then you know, ask them for, for some feedback about these options by a certain date. Um, it seems, you know, even if it's an email to them. Um, we, I think we not only really need to go back and start talking about the process for, um, for getting information out to our community, but also the process for answering public comment. We get public comment at every meeting, and then we also get these emails and thoughtful, um, uh, you know, thoughtful uh, questions and comment in between by way of email. Um, and, and I don't see a place where we go back and we say, you know, so-and-so asked this really uh, important question. And so we weave some of the things into our, uh, you know, biweekly discussions, but I don't know that there's a place or a time where we say, this has been asked, this has been answered. And I think that we need a process for that as well. Um, and then I know that when we did community forums before, I had asked for, if we had any demographic information on who attends these things, who are we hearing from? Are they the, the parents of the kids that are um, you know, the, in our school system now? Are they um, retirees? Are they, you know, who are we reaching? I think we need to understand who we're reaching because we don't know who we're not reaching if we don't know who we are reaching. Um, and that, that seems to be really important and not something that we have really gotten a great handle on. Um, that's it, thank you. My only comment, um, Phoebe, to that is um, the forums, there is a lot of um, an anonymity going on there only because people don't necessarily have to, we, have, we get emails. So without, um, we could ask people to disclose who they are, but then sometimes feel like they don't wanna have to register. So that's a, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. And you know, I, I know you've been awesome in the community outreach and, and maybe we can have a conversation about how we can track these people better so we know where people are, um, who, who we're reaching and who else and how else can we reach others. I need to do a time check. It's uh, 1027 and we were scheduled to end by 1030. Um, I definitely want to take public comments. So um, we clearly don't have time to get into another discussion on the evaluation criteria. So that will move yet again. Um, can people stay 15 minutes extra so that we can do a vote on the invoice and then take public comments. Does that work for everyone? Um, and it may be that we, our, our two guests, uh, Jen, Jennifer Bernardo may want to say, so is, that's okay. So, it, so I'm just going to uh, go right to invoices. Um, we, Sean said we have an invoice um, for answer and then I need to do a roll call vote on uh, uh, the invoice. Can everyone see it? Margaret, do you want to walk through this invoice? Yeah, um, what might be helpful, 
Sean, is if you can just scroll to the, um, I mean, just in a nutshell, everybody saw the numbers there. There is detail behind this that as always sort of describes what we're doing. Uh, last month, um, there was quite a bit of, there was not as, we do not have anywhere near as much work on the PDP submission as um, Danisco does, but we here, we're doing work on that on the website and uh, you know, preparing uh, the meeting record. And Phoebe, just to sort of respond a little bit to your comment, we are making an effort to make sure in the meeting minutes, um, particularly with the net zero, which we've gotten a lot of written comments about, that the questions and the answers are incorporated. So, so that's, I think that's all I have to say about this. There's some time in here for Shelly Pator, who's our net zero um, guru who has been attending the net zero meetings, but not the billing committee meetings. I move to approve the invoice. Do I have a second? Second. Um, I will do a roll call vote. Um, and as I call out your name, uh, indicate how you vote. Ben. Yes. Rupert. Roy Clark, aye. Uh, Tammy. Yes. Paul. Yes. Sean. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Phoebe. Yep. Alicia. Yes. Simone. Simone. Yes. So that's unanimous with two absent, Margaret, by my count. Got it. So if, if everyone's agreed, I want to open it up for public comments. Um, and Sean, I think will help me with a show of hands of who wants to speak. So anyone who would like to speak, please raise your hand. Um, okay, so I see one, two, three, three people, four people. Four people so far. So Sean, um, Sean has brought in first Benhala, you're in. And if you unmute, we will be able to hear you. Thank you, good morning. Um, first, I'd just like to thank this committee very much and then I'll just get to the point because we're limited time. I'd like to comment in response to the last meeting where access to public transportation was thought or at least discussed to not be important or critical. My words, not theirs, but that was what I was left feeling. And admittedly, I'm the outlier when a divorce caused my child to have parents in different school district zones. So three days a week, I didn't have a car for four years. We spent three hours on the PVTA round trip to get her to school and back. Um, but the times when I would see many more families on the bus would be when a class was presenting or a science fair, an assembly, a performance. Um, so yes, the school bus can get our students there, but when the families are invited or the caregivers are invited to support them pre-pandemic, I'm not sure gonna, what's gonna happen or going forward, but that, would, that felt important to me during the school days and evenings. And another time, if we're thinking about this building being used, um, I'd see a lot of families as not part of the education program, but definitely part of the whole child experience getting to schools for soccer games, basketball games. And two of the schools at the time were more conveniently located on the bus line, but there was one that was really problematic to get to, but we'd do it, we'd walk through school just to save the extra time on the sidewalks, I mean, through the snow. And so I just want, if we're thinking about this building and equity and opportunities outside of just the program and getting the kid on the bus and to school is when the families would be able to come support their students and or extracurricular sports and um, performing arts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hala. Uh, so Maria Kopecki. And can you hear me? Yes. So first, um, I want to thank the folks that came in to talk about geotechnical. I thought that was a extraordinarily good uh, presentation and good information that we got there. I have a question that uh, I have asked several times, but um, we don't still seem to have the answer to, which um, is where is the response from the MSBA for the PDP? It's been a very long time. 
Um, and I'm wondering if anybody from the town or the building committee has communicated with the MSBA and asked what the delay is about, when we can expect the response, um, and whether this delayed response is going to impact any other, the proposed timeline that you guys are working on. Another question I had um, was to, uh, again, see any of the uh, communications that went between uh, the designers and the cost estimators so far to produce to produce the preliminary information, I still think that it, it would it is important for the school building committee to see any uh, design basis documents, pr pricing narrative, whatever it uh, is going to be called, that will be sent from the designers to AM Fogarty before that gets sent so that you can proofread it, make sure it includes everything that, that we've been talking about um, at these meetings. Um, I do want to also talk about the two-story alternative. Um, as was pointed out, there was only one design for a two-story building and three alternatives for a three-story building. And I didn't see any attempt in there to solve some of the problems that were noted in some of the three-story designs in a two-story design. I did not see any uh, attempt to talk about the pros and cons of these two approaches relative to one another. There was no discussion of having an increased roof means you have increased PV that you can put on the roof as opposed to on canopies or in ground mounted solar. There's a lot to talk about um, and it does not feel like that's getting uh, thorough analysis, a two story alternative. And while there have been some opinions put forth about uh, different energy efficiency and cost and a quote of 10%, I am going to ask that those numbers be thoroughly vetted. And what is the difference? The, if it is a difference, uh, and you, you need to document before you toss out a number um, especially when I keep getting told that we don't have cost estimates and we don't, you don't have the information. So to throw out numbers without that information is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, that's all I'll comment on for today. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, Bruce called them. Uh, to some extent, uh, uh, I, I'll disagree with what Maria, Maria just said. I, I just wanted to call in to speak to the process briefly. Um, uh, um, Kathy, uh, Donna, Margaret, I, I, I don't have as strong concerns as uh, Alicia does over the process or uh, Maria. My sense is that uh, the concepts that have been developed and shown seem to my mind to have been uh, so far systematically and appropriately evaluated. And I can see why the design team would come up with, from their point of view, a preferred scheme. Maybe it shouldn't be represented as the committee's preferred scheme, but I think it's important and helpful for the design team to tell us where they are in their thinking. Um, so far as the process in terms of uh, acknowledging uh, public comments and so forth, I don't feel, and I'm one that's made a lot of public comments, both uh, in this fashion and through emails, uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm not uh, feeling that the uh, committee or the, the, the process is obliged to formally acknowledge those, I trust that uh, my comments are being recorded and are being taken into account in, one, in whatever way they feel is appropriate uh, by uh, the committee and by the design team. There is a design budget here. There is a time budget here too as well. And we can, of course, ask our consultants uh, to uh, investigate all of these options thoroughly in the way which Maria just did. But there are going to be times a year from now when we're also going to want to be able to investigate things thoroughly. And this level of investment has to be managed because there's a budget and it has to be expended wisely. So doing more than what the design team have already done with these concepts 
would seem to me to be pushing the limits of common sense and uh, wisdom when it comes to expending the time and fiscal budgets that everybody is working under. So I, I want to say that from my point of view, and I've been watching all but now two of these meetings for the past year and a half, that I think the process is sound. I'm trusting it. I know that people will have complaints and so forth at the end that they weren't properly listened to or represented. I've been on this game for 50 years and I've never heard anything other than that in these types of processes. We try to minimize it, but we don't have to be enthralled to the fact that there's somebody who feels misrepresented, misunderstood or ignored. We're gonna try and make that number zero, but we're not gonna be able to. So just to note of support for the process, I think as I have been witnessing it, it seems to be in good hands. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Just Pam, you've you've joined us. If you unmute, we will be able to hear you. Thank you. Yes, Pam Rooney, uh, forty-two Cottage Street. Um, I was. Thank you very much for this. The extensive geo geotechnical review that was very very helpful, and I think I am coming away with an understanding that there really are. Um, essentially as many site problems at Wildwood as there are at um, at Fort River. Fort River is more obvious to, to many. Um, I think given, uh, struck by the amount of site work at, at Wildwood, um, I'm, I'm hoping that in the cost estimates that, that occur, that um, Somebody looked pretty carefully at the uh, the cost of replacing the existing infrastructure. Someone someone mentioned that there's extensive infrastructure on that site, and we know that there's the Tanbrook pipe. Uh, there's also a, a large storm drain um, catch basin at the edge of the steep hill, and all of that kind of stormwater management infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. certainly will need some attention. So in terms of cost estimates, that's that's something to consider. Um, I was I was also struck by the fact that the in the ad reno conversation that uh, it became clear that the Wildwood site really does not include does not require the um, the extensive addition of fill, which which is a good thing, uh, and that and that even the modification of the existing existing building would not require demolition of the floor slab and addition of, of fill on the interior of the building, which I imagine could cause a lot of problems just with ceiling heights and, and utilities and all of that. So in terms of the ad reno uh, opportunity, it looked like um, on the Wildwood site that that would be a preferred um, option for Wildwood to, to have an ad reno configuration. Uh, if, if I look at the site with the building placement on it, um, it, it's the ad reno opportunity at Wildwood appears to be a very, very conducive location for uh, a future building rather than perching something out at the edge of the property on the edge of a, of a fairly steep slope. So, um, I hope that's all taken into consideration when you're actually selecting uh, the preferred alternative. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Tony, you're, you are with us if you unmute. Hi, thank you. Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Um, so this, I agree with the other comments about the geotechnical discussion being extremely helpful today. Um, some of the takeaways I got from it is that you're no longer thinking of building into the hill. You're no longer thinking of using the middle school field for play for Wildwood. And that the challenges are similar at both sites as it relates to groundwater and stormwater. Uh, the one difference is raising Fort River by one to two feet. 
And then uh, Kathy noted that the addition renovation option at Wildwood offers a better layout or use of the site. So they were four new takeaways that I had from today. I would like to um, add on to uh, the ask of having additional two-story concepts. I think the two-story offers a lot of advantages. As far as I'm aware, I think the licensure for teachers in Massachusetts is a K through two for early childhood licensure. I know that came up with the last project when second grade was gonna be at one site and K through one at the other. So the advantage of keeping K through two together on one floor might be appealing to the teachers in those grades and then having three through three through five on the second floor. Um, also the, the uh, Donna mentioned about a linear plan, two-story plan not fitting on both sites. I would like to check if you actually think that a, a building of that shape wouldn't fit at Fort River, because there seems to be a lot of room at Fort River. And perhaps at Wildwood it wouldn't fit, but it seems like Fort River it would fit. Um, the geothermal, have you given up on the idea of geothermal on the Wildwood site? I know I noticed it's no longer in the drawings, the test fit drawings. Um, and then with uh, discarding the use of the middle school field for play, um, what is the comparison of green space if you're just left with the Wildwood site after you put in the parking lot and the building? Uh, how does it compare to Fort River as far as green space per child, like if there's a square footage per student? Because um, it seems like there will be very little green space at the Wildwood site if you were to put a, a um, the school there. And I think that's everything. Um, oh, one last thing. So with the uh, middle school field being wet, according to Jason Skills and Guilford Mooring, presumably even if you put the geothermal there and you wanted to replace it in kind so that the, the regional students could use it, would you also have to increase it by one to two feet, just like you're proposing at the Fort River site to make that field more usable? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I think, am, am I right, Sean, that I think that is we, everyone who did public comment. Um, so we are meeting again in two weeks, but we also have the community forum and the community forum, I think everyone has seen that it's scheduled. There is a brochure that uh, I think was just finished yesterday and I'll make sure people have it. It does have the site information and the potential designs. So I think to the extent, um, Donna, you're gonna be showing any other layouts or, you know, I had a question, for example, on ad reno, we've never discussed where the rooms are, but you had, at least in one of the pictures, the gym was on the second floor rather than the first floor. Um, so just thinking even on a, if we want that to be a community resource, it would need to be on the first floor, but, so the community forum will be providing information, but also getting a lot of input. So we would like to get as many people there. We will send the brochure to everyone and I'm going to show it for the council. Alicia and I will be at the council on Monday night and we'll try to get it out to the various newsletters and try to feature it in our district meetings. There's at least a couple happening this weekend to get people to come in because it will be a way to get input both on choices of the two sites, uh, choices of new versus ad reno, new three-story, two-story. So we have- so Kathy, yeah, so, I yeah. sent the brochure around to the committee last night. So okay, so so everyone got the, the brochure last night. Yeah, so that, that will be posted. It's also going out to all the news outlets we have. Um, so I want to thank everyone for patience and being willing to go longer. Um, the this evaluation criteria matrix, we did receive um, a thoughtful public comment. Um, anyone on the committee who has any comments on the potential, the, if you can send them in to me, I will collect all of them so we can make it a really efficient discussion. Um, and I did forget to put in the edit, building flexibility, flexibility for growth was in more than once and I forgot to move it to one place and it disappeared. So that is, a, I will send out a potential revision. But in any case, we that will be important for us to start doing some of these comparisons. So trying to put a period on it, as my mother-in-law used to say, on finishing what I'm writing, it would be nice to have time next time. 
So I think that's it. And you know, just um, on MSBA, um, we are expecting comments. There has been a request on a weekly basis on where is it, where is it? We haven't forgotten. So that will likely be on the next agenda. Um, so we will be getting a document with their comments on it and it, we are expecting it to be on the May 6th agenda, you know, unless something falls through the cracks. So with that, I am going to say that the meeting is adjourned at 1048. And again, I thank everyone, especially those of you who it was your school vacation week and you're here anyway. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Bye.